the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, but real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. about kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shahadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. Good morning. I'm Sophie Richardson. I'm Human Rights Watch's China Director, and I'd like to start our morning's day by thanking the Edinburgh International Book Festival and its incredibly dynamic audience. It's a pleasure uh, and a privilege to participate in this, and it's especially a relief that Joshua Wong is still able to participate in this. I've been at Human Rights Watch since 2006, and our work has focus quite a bit on Hong Kong as human rights there have deteriorated significantly. I've had the pleasure of meeting Joshua several times uh, and had the pain of having to write about his and his allies increasing threats to their own rights, uh, the loss of rights to political participation, threats to the independent media, and now increasingly harassment uh, and arbitrary arrest and detention of pro-democracy activists. Uh, I think our mission this morning is to talk about what's at stake uh, in Hong Kong as the Chinese government uh, moves aggressively to rob 7 million people of their rights, but also to talk about Joshua's own experience, his leadership, uh, and his new book. Uh, let me give a very brief introduction for someone who's accomplished an enormous amount at a young age. Uh, Joshua, at the ripe old age of 14, uh, founded a group called Scholarism, uh, that was best known for campaigning against a patriotic education campaign, a, an effort to remake uh, the Hong Kong education system to be more pro-nationalist and sympathetic to Beijing. In 2014, he was one of the key leaders of what was known as the Umbrella Movement, uh, months of demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations uh, in Hong Kong that were really pushing for respect for greater democracy and voting rights. In 2016, he and his allies founded Demosisto, uh, a new political movement. In 2017, for uh, a number of charges related to some of these activities that Human Rights Watch found extremely problematic, Joshua spent three months in jail. Uh, in 2019, uh, he was one of the prominent voices in the movement against the proposed extradition arrangements in Hong Kong that would have allowed people to be sent to the mainland for prosecution, which is very worrying because the rights to a fair trial 
uh, are elusive in the mainland. Uh, and concerns about torture and ill-treatment and detention uh, run high there. And then in 2020, the publication of the book we're here to talk about this morning, Unfree Speech, The Threat to Global Democracy and Why We Must have, Act Now. Uh, two other quick facts about Joshua that he explains in the book, uh, that he didn't entirely become accustomed to being referred to as 4030XX, his prison number while he was at Pickhook. Uh, I think I, I would, as a, as a mom and an activist, I also want to point out that Joshua is an incredible hero to my 14-year-old son and his friends, and I think he's playing an important role inspiring uh, activism worldwide. We'll come back to that. Joshua, it's wonderful to see you. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. My first question to you, you published Unfree Speech in February of this year. It's now August. So why don't you start us out by explaining a little bit about what's happened uh, in the intervening months. Uh, thank you for the invitation and it's my pleasure to share some of my insights and point of view on what's happening in Hong Kong and how I continue the activism journey in this global city under the hotline crackdown of Beijing. So as people might aware that uh, national security law is already implemented in Hong Kong since uh, early July of this year. So it results in the tremendous hotline crackdown. And apart from all of the books that I published in Hong Kong uh, were banned in Hong Kong Public Library. My daily life are uh, being stalked by unknown private car. And uh, two hours before this sharing section, I was just held by uh, unknown car with China Hong Kong license, even on weekend. And I think it also imply how the threats exist. And not only about uh, the book being banned or being traced by the unknown private car at the same time. Uh, I think how uh, activists in Hong Kong also experience the massive arrest. In this city with only 7 million population, we have almost 10,000 Hong Kongers were arrested since last summer the youngest one at the age of 11, and the oldest one at the age of 84. So who can imagine primary school or high school kid will, would be arrested by riot charges? But that's the reality in Hong Kong. And that's also the reason for me to publish this book, Unfree Speech. I hope to let the voice of Hong Kong is being heard around the world. Joshua, tell us this. Maybe you can explain a little more to the audience about the new national security law, but also, you know, just this week, we're, we're watching a Singaporean activist, Jolivan Wham, spend 10 days in jail simply for having been on a Skype call with you. Does the national security law actually make our conversation this morning a risk to you? Could you be prosecuted simply for having this discussion? Uh, national security law is kind of speech crime. It's not the matter of national security. It's the matter of the communist regime security and who are not loyal enough to Beijing might be targeted by this law. Uh, with, the, uh, with the rules and regulation and article in the national security law in Hong Kong, uh, with the arbitrary and wide definition of collusion with foreign force, even conducting in the field, or uh, joining any kind of conference uh, virtually might also be recognized as violating the national security law, especially I'm conducting this sharing uh, with uh, the Human Rights Watch director and Human Rights Watch is already being targeted by Beijing to be uh, list on the sanction, uh, uh, in, in the sanction list. So uh, someone might ask me that, uh, should I uh, stop any kind of uh, engagement in the global community. But as the writer of this book, I think also that's my duty and responsibility, continue to let the world to know that here is still Hong Kong, is choose not to kowtow to Beijing. Because if we keep silence under such chilling effect, um, I think it will be the nightmare for us. Uh, but no matter what happened, I think uh, one point I also realized is conducting this interview, or joining this book sharing section in this book festival might also be recognized as kind of the crime from the perspective of Beijing. Perhaps the national security agent in Hong Kong is also watching, watching this uh, video sharing section. Let me 
ask you a, a, a sort of 30,000 a foot question. Let's back up a little bit because you know, Hong Kong is not the only place where we're seeing threats to political rights or mm. problems around elections or popular protests around issues ranging from uh, you know, the lack of justice for mm. different races or ethnicities or threats to electoral processes. Tell us why Hong, what's happening in Hong Kong is important. Why should, why should people who don't have a particular connection to the place care about what's happening there? Uh, Hong Kong people are facing the largest authoritarian regime in the world. That's no doubt at all. And at the same time, uh, I also realize uh, that's the threat from uh, Beijing. But uh, if people ask, that, so why about Hong Kong? Because there's still a lot of country around the world uh, that's under the authoritarian regime suppression. I would say that because uh, apart from China, it's the largest authoritarian regime in the world. The first is Hong Kong, the next is Taiwan, and later on is the rest of the world. And I think the issue of Hong Kong is not only the matter between US-China relation, it's not only about the escalation uh, conflict between US and China, it's also about when China expanded its influence not only in Asia Pacific, but also through the Belt and Road Initiative, the investment of the uh, of those infrastructure in uh, Africa and etc. to uh, show its sharp power expansion. I would say that when Beijing broke the promise of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, the UN filed the international treaty that related to Hong Kong. They could also use the same way targeted any country or city around the world. So to sum up, uh, what experiencing by Hong Kong people might also be experienced by people in the free world in the upcoming future. And that's the reason why Hong Kong's matter to the world. In the book, you cover a remarkable series of events or the span of time, uh, what Hong Kong was like when you started uh, becoming politically aware, contrasted to what's happened in the intervening years. And in the introduction to the book, you wrote that Hong Kong people, quote, are struggling to carve our place in the world and develop an identity in our own image. I'm curious to know, what, what's that image today relative to your 12-year-old self when you started to become politically aware? Um, that's a good question. And uh, when we talk about the identity of Hong Kongers, in last century before I born, people always emphasize Hong Kong is the place uh, with uh, Hong Kong is the borrowed time with borrowed uh, places. And uh, when we talk about uh, Hong Kong, it's only about investment, uh, business, uh, uh, business development, and about how the stock price and about the housing policy. And uh, when people talk about Hong Kong, we're only about Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan uh, with Kung Fu or Dim Sum and that's all. It seems that Hong Kong people are a, uh, seems to be a political and uh, will also be summarized as economic animal. But I think with what we tried to do in the previous one decade, since I was still a high school student, we hope to let the voice of Hong Kongers being heard and also prove that Hong Kongers are not a political and we are not only economic animal. Apart from the financial market, apart from the business development, we also realize that Hong Kong is a unique place with the freedom fighter that fight for the value that all we cherish. And when people talk about Hong Kong since the umbrella movement in 2014, I hope people can remember and recall the bravery and the courage of the people in the city. And uh, some people in Hong Kong might recognize themselves as Chinese, some may not. But no matter what uh, kind of identity they have, uh, we all have the consensus, we are Hong Kong, the unique identity that all we uphold. Let me ask you about a different aspect of Hong Kong identity and that, that varies a bit from, from the, the international perception of Hong Kong, mostly just as a financial hub. Uh, you know, we know that Hong Kong has for a long time been important, uh, an important location for universities, that there's some world-class uh, educational institutions there. Um, you know, some of which have recently stood up and publicly expressed support for the national security law, presumably under pressure uh, from Hong Kong or mainland authorities. And I think that's a disturbing uh, aspect of threats to academic freedom. But I think one aspect of Hong Kong that's hard for people sometimes to see 
is that it is a place with a vibrant culture, literature, art, documentary films, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that there is a strong tradition there of artistic and, and intellectual activity. How do you see that having changed particularly in you know, your first foray into writing a book and having some more interaction with that community distinct from, from the, the community of political activists. Uh, yeah, and I think that's also the point that I would like to share because uh, in the previous day, uh, there's also some of the politicians in Hong Kong that would deliver the voice of Hong Kongs around the world. But I think apart from some of the delegation travel to uh, London to meet with MPs or to the Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. I think published a book uh, with the name of Unfree um, Speech and also with one of uh, the documentary that now released on Netflix related to the main in name Joshua Teenager versus, versus Superpower. Those are also critical at all and necessary for me to deliver the words because uh, if uh, only having the delegation to meet with politician, uh, it will be easier. But only narrowing the uh, the uh, the targeted audience that might be uh, someone highly interested in politics or etc. But I think published this book uh, on free speech uh, uh, is I think one of the reasons is I hope to let ordinary citizens, especially youngsters, to know that how even a high school student uh, since the age of 15 can also make differences and also make change and let the regime to know that they need to listen to the voice of young generation. So from my journey since uh, 2011, uh, 2011 till now, uh, I think uh, one part of it is about how we are against Beijing crackdown to fight for freedom. But another part of it is also about youth activism. Uh, I am really impressed by a lot of youngsters, uh, not only in Asia, but even in the Western world, uh, no matter Black Lives Matter or Greta Thunberg or others, how uh, millennials could also take a prominent role to make difference when uh, always those upper class elites hope to determine the future or to dominate the future of their hometown, how youngsters uh, take the courage to make change, I think it, I hope to through this book to impress more young generation that is even younger than me, especially I'm not the one belongs to the millennials because I born in 1996. So more youngster could engage in civil society development, it will be beneficial for the global uh, development in the future. I was going to ask you about how you see yourself as part of a, a growing global community of young activists. I would add to the list that you just provided, you know, someone like Emma Gonzalez, who's become, you know, a very powerful voice around gun control here in the U.S., uh, you know, or someone like Greta Thunberg. But do you feel that that leaders either in Hong Kong or Beijing or in other parts of the world dismiss your or their work because you're young? Um... It seems to be uh, experiencing some difficulties in the previous day. What I mean is during the umbrella movement. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in the previous few decades, uh, in country uh, around the world or cities, uh, they will also have democracy movement. But most of the time, might lead by uh, the uh, the icon of that movement might be at the age of at least uh, above twenty five years old or maybe a human rights lawyer, a um, political uh, political science professor, uh, seldom will become from a high school kid. So a few years ago, apart from people might be more interested of how high school students lead a political or social movement. But at the same time, they will also have hesitation compared to the movement in South Korea, in Taiwan, uh, led by human rights lawyer, uh, some of the journalists or uh, some of the activists there are more experienced, uh, never will be led by a 14, 15, 16 years old high school kid. So um, they might also have some of the hesitation of how to understanding a youngster to be the icon or seems to be the leader of the movement. But I think since uh, what happened in the umbrella movement of 2014 to um, uh, what we call the uh, be water movement in 2019. Uh, it also show how uh, from the generation of baby boomers and the generation of millennials, all we stand as one with solidarity and unity to make change. And even youngster and high school student could take uh, 
kind of critical role to make change and contribute to the movement. And uh, democracy movement in last century, always led by human rights lawyer or a scholar from the civil society. But I think since 2000 or in the past uh, decade, we already proved that even high school and university students can contribute more. Yeah, I think it's incredibly exciting and a little bit reassuring about the future, but I also think one of the most powerful, enduring images of some of your work, you know, has been what, you know, when you have appeared with, for example, Martin Lee, who's now 81, considered to be the father of Hong Kong's democracy movement, and the idea that, you know, the demand for human rights and political participation, it, you know, cuts across generations, that it's not just you know, people who started talking about these issues in the 80s and the 90s, that, that's sort of a passing of the torch. And Joshua, you've talked a little bit about some of the work that you've done uh, dealing with other governments. And I'd like to ask you to tell us what you, or how you respond to the criticism that some people have lodged that you have counted too much on the US particularly at a time when, while the Trump administration has, Human Rights Watch's view, taken some positive steps around particularly sanctions against Chinese government officials, particularly around Xinjiang uh, and, and horrific human rights violations against Uyghurs, but also uh, imposed some sanctions on Hong Kong officials. You know, but many other Trump administration policies and practices are deeply problematic from a human rights perspective. So how do you, tell us a little bit about how you've engaged this particular U.S. government and how you would respond to criticisms that, you're, you're, that you and your allies are taking advantage of a fight between the U.S. and China to gain more prominence for yourselves. Um, the main goal for the Hong Kong uh, democracy movement in the global community of course, is wish to maximize uh, the global support on protester. And I always emphasize that uh, supporting Hong Kong should not be the matter of left or right, and it's only the matter of right or wrong. Uh, compared to countries around the world, uh, the demand and request of Hong Kong people is crystal clear. Is if Hong Kong is being recognized as some of the one of the greatest global city just like New York or London. So why they can elect their mayor and why can't Hong Kong? And we just hope to add our votes to elect our administration. And for what I observe and what I experienced, I would say that as an activist upholding on a progressive value, uh, global media, of course, will focus more on uh, our fight uh, on free election. But apart from political system reform, how activists, including in Hong Kong, recognize the importance to uphold LGBT rights, environmental justice, deal with the reissue of climate change, and also about the ethnic minority. I think those are the reissue that really matter. So apart from international advocacy and the previous engagement with politicians, I think the idea of multi-alliance in Southeast Asia, to have the civil society collaboration to enhance the value that all we uphold and cherish will be really important. And for some of the accusation or critics would say that how we only rely on the US administration. I would say that we rely on Hong Kong people, their commitment to fight for freedom. And we also encourage the world to stand with Hong Kong. And that's why uh, around 10 or 20 minutes ago, uh, before this, uh, sh uh, during the uh, earlier uh, earlier section of this sharing, I already emphasized that the issue of Hong Kong is not only about the matter between US and China, not only between the tension of these two uh, superpowers around the world. It's met also matter for Africa, for Asia Pacific, uh, for European country to realize that if Hong Kong fall and later on the world will fall, and what happening in Hong Kong will also be one of the remarkable crystal ball and let the world to know that what happening and the destiny of Hong Kongers would also related to what happening for the citizens that uh, in the country if they need to make friends or deal with China. Let me turn that on its head a little bit because one of the criticisms um, that's been made, uh, you know, both of, of Human Rights Watch and others and of yourself and some of your colleagues is to say that the protests and the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong 
is really just a front for uh, anti-China activity by the US government. Uh, and indeed, a Chinese diplomat came to uh, the press conference that Human Rights Watch held in New York after we were not able to release our world report in Hong Kong in January. And one of the points that this Chinese diplomat made was that we were responsible, we Human Rights Watch and other organizations, not Hong Kong groups, were responsible for the chaos in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, there's, there's this refrain throughout Chinese political rhetoric that the protests in Hong Kong were organized and could not have been organized or really reflect the views of people in Hong Kong, uh, which, which is both not true, but also strikes us as being shockingly patronizing. What's, what's your reaction when you hear a Chinese government official credit somebody else uh, for the activism of, of people in Hong Kong? Uh, those are misleading narrative and uh, pro-communist uh, uh, regime propaganda that they hope to mislead people to uh, accuse or assume the movement or the protest in Hong Kong uh, is uh, controlled by some of the foreign agents. But I think they have no ground at, at all. And that's the some of the narrative that they always try to generate. That, for example, in the pro-Beijing uh, news media in Hong Kong, they even claim that I was appointed by the US government as one of the CIA agents and trained by the US Marine and uh, to have the battle training. But I think those uh, mislead at all and no one would trust on it. But the reason behind for them to generate those propaganda is to enhance the Chinese nationalism and to strengthen uh, people in mainland China to embrace Beijing authorities. But I think uh, in a uh, place around the world without the Great Firewall, uh, no one would trust on it. And uh, even when my parents know that uh, those pro-Beijing newspapers claim that I was trained by US Marine and was one of the CIA agents, they even asked me that why I'm not uh, strong as Tom Cruise. Yeah, so I think those are really uh, uh, silly and naive accusation from the pro-Beijing camp. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. Um, Let's try to be optimistic and, and, and do a little thought experiment here, which is let's imagine Hong Kong becomes democratic, that people have full rights to political participation, the legislative council is entirely democratically elected, the national security law gets rolled back. What would have to have happened inside the mainland for that to be possible in Hong Kong now, do you think? Uh, you mean happen or what, sorry? Let's try to imagine what it would take, what would need to change in Beijing for Hong Kong to become fully democratic. Um, one day is still Xi Jinping be the one who ruled China and Hong Kong. I see no chance for Hong Kong to have free election and democracy compared to the era of the Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008 under the leadership of Wu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. I think now the hotline approach uh, towards Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, Uyghurs, and uh, uh, the Western world uh, is the situation that we never imagined in the past. But I would say that even I have no hope towards the government, I still have hope towards people. And where I remember in 2018, uh, during the day of the Chinese National People Congress, amend their constitution and allow uh, Xi Jinping uh, to be the president in the, in the upcoming 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I saw the TV news in prison. And so I think now it seems that uh, the clock is ticking and the time is running out in Hong Kong. But our fight for freedom it's also about the matter of timing, how we can continue our fight uh, with solidarity. And until the day that, uh, I'm not sure when will be the day uh, we can get a victory, but there's no reason for us to give up. Well, on that, on that note in particular, uh, you know, Human Rights Watch reports are filled with recommendations about how to fix or, or respond to human rights violations. And 
there's a great set of recommendations at the end of your book. So with a view towards affecting positive change, you know, what two or three recommendations would you highlight for people who, who are listening in on this conversation today? What can they do to try to contribute to improvements in Hong Kong? Uh, if anyone uh, has the incentive to support Hong Kong and stand with the Hong Kong fellow protester, uh, follow on our Twitter account will be the really great first step. Uh, on Twitter, uh, lots of politicians uh, in Hong Kong, including me, um, we try to update uh, the protests and strike in Hong Kong uh, regularly every day in English and even in other foreign language and hope to let our voice being heard and to grab the global community attention. At the same time, uh, we also aware that uh, how we need to keep on our fight. So uh, when some of the uh, global co uh, company or enterprise or etc., it seems that they try to count out to China, no matter about the incident of NBA censorship and how the Blizzard uh, game company uh, erodes uh, on some of the free speech and etc. I think those are the reason that. Uh, those are also the channel that they need to care about it. So uh, to sum up, follow our Twitter, uh, read the news about Hong Kong, especially support a, a company that uh, recognize the importance of democratization or to boycott those companies that shrink the loyalty to Beijing uh, would be also some of the idea that I mentioned uh, in 2019. Great, thanks. I'm going to ask you just one or two more quick questions, then we're going to take some from the audience. Uh, perhaps just we'll just focus on one, which is that you know, even what you were dealing with in in the few hours leading up to this event, I think, makes very clear that you are living under constant pressure, constant, uh, and it's gotten worse over time. And you've paid a pretty high price already for your activism. How do you? deal with that? How do you, how do you process these stresses? Uh, as I've mentioned, I was told by an unknown car with China Hong Kong license uh, two hours ago. And uh, even I visit the Victoria Peak Garden in Hong Kong in the, in the mountain uh, with my dog. And they still trace on me and uh, take photo on me. And six of those pro Beijing uh, gangs, uh, they just surround me and my friend and continuously provoke me with verbal abuse. And I think those are the common tactics that they use to uh, target uh, pro-democracy activists. But I would say that uh, compared to a lot of millennials, the price I pay is comparatively small. I just uh, remember on 2019, we're a high school student at the age of 16. Uh, he was fired by life wrong and um, that uh, that life wrong uh, fire into uh, his chest and uh, I think those are the things and the risks that take by high school students join the protest uh, since 2019 and uh, being harassed uh, with the surveillance and being stalked or traced by a pro Beijing Asian might not become a news in Hong Kong already, but um, I still believe that uh, democracy is not come with compromise uh, or uh, how to count out to the law uh, to the regime. Democracy is come with our spirit of resistance. Even Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore, but with the spirit of Hong Kongers, we still go forward in this uphill battle. A remarkable sense of tenacity you have, uh, and we certainly hope that uh, the national security law doesn't wind up uh, coming to haunt you in particular, but we are extremely concerned about the number of open cases against pro-democracy activists and what the future holds now that Beijing has as a tool you know, a law that it can use really to prosecute anyone it wants, whenever it wants, for whatever it wants. We'll be certainly watching very closely. Uh, I want to take a couple of the questions that have come in uh, through the festival. 
One is, and this speaks to a point that you were just making, Joshua, you've said your struggle is global and have recently expressed support for the people in Belarus. What other countries or movements are inspiring you at the moment and what other illiberal or authoritarian forces concern you? Uh, with the experience of uh, being detained at the Bangkok airport in Thailand a few years ago during my visit uh, to Chulalongkorn University and being blacklisted by Malaysia government before that democratic reform a few years ago and with uh, how the Singapore government uh, jailed my friend uh, in prison because of setting up the Skype conference in me. I always, uh, my friend told me that uh, any country make friends with China, I was not allowed to enter, especially most are in Southeast Asia. So as a Hong Kong, it's really disappointed that I can't travel or visit those Southeast Asia country with my family members. But uh, it seems to be ironic, but I would say that it also implied the influence of uh, Hong Kong protests and how activists in Hong Kong, we are not uh, satisfied with only engaging in the local community. We also need to seek for global support. Even we can't uh, make any kind of concrete efficacy, uh, no matter related to sanction, embargoes, or et cetera, after the national security law uh, is implemented in Hong Kong. But we still have Hong Kong fellow activists that now based overseas continue the advocacy and to let the voice being heard and let Beijing to realize that how Hong Kong is, no matter uh, how the challenge, uh, we still keep on. And now it's not the matter that we live in Hong Kong anymore. It's about the matter that will we still uphold the spirit of Hong Kongers. So one of the reactions to the imposition of the national security law uh, from another government uh, from the UK was to announce uh, an expansion of access to people in Hong Kong under the British National Overseas Scheme. Uh, it's a it's a bureaucratically complicated reality, but it's it's one of the ways that another government has tried to say that if people from Hong Kong want to leave, uh, there's some ability to relocate to the UK. And one person has asked whether you think many Hong Kong residents will want to settle in the UK. Uh, providing lifeboats for Hong Kong is, uh, is an extremely good move. And uh, I think apart from providing assistance or lifeboat for Hong Kong people, how country could send a clear signal to the world that they will not count out to China and also reminding Beijing to uphold uh, their accountability to respect the international order and liberal value. Uh, those are also uh, significant and important. But how can we try uh, to continue the fight and uh, e uh, with the chilling effect and the massive crackdown? I think the challenge that is given by the communist regime already. Uh, but I'm still optimistic that we can overcome it. What other act actions are you calling on other governments to take? What would you like to see You know, the, the US, the UK, the UN, the EU? What should they be doing in response to these recent developments in Hong Kong? Uh, I think different countries might have different diplomatic concern and geopolitical consideration. Uh, for example, even in Europe, I think the concern of uh, Germany and uh, UK might be totally different at all. It's also about how they uh, deal with the economic interests and the human rights uh, condition and how could they prioritize more on human rights and etc. But at least I think how they could stand with Hong Kong is really matter because uh, stand with Hong Kong is not only about the situation inside Hong Kong. It's also about how the world should deal with the uncertainty and the threat from the hotline crackdown of the communist regime. Uh, of course, this kind of uh, narrative or description, I'm not sure after this interview will I be arrested uh, tomorrow uh, by the national security law because of joining this books festival sharing. But I still realize Beijing should know that uh, what we're asking for is just record and mention in the joint declaration and we are not asking something go too far and they hope to use the tactics uh, successfully achieve what they hope in Xinjiang and Tibet and to apply in Hong Kong but I believe they will not success at all because uh, Hong Kong people still keep on the fight uh, with different ways and means. Great. Um... 
One other question is how much does high profile international news and support uh, for democracy matter to the freedom loving people of Hong Kong? Um, I think since uh, one part I would also like to add is I think since last year uh, protest, uh, it also widened and, uh, and widened the definition of Hong Kong. In the previous day, uh, Hong Kong is, is just only the identity that related to anyone who fight for democracy, freedom, uphold rule of law and judicial independence that are lived in Hong Kong. But uh, after the protest in 2019, I also realized that anyone who love and care about Hong Kong, even they are not born in Hong Kong or live in Hong Kong, they could also recognize themselves as Hong Kong. And I think how uh, the... Uh, the new definition and understanding on Hong Kong has also encouraged more people around the world to stand with Hong Kong, yeah. And do you think that there's now greater interaction between, for example, pro-democracy activists from and in Hong Kong with other communities uh, that have been targeted for repression by Chinese authorities, Uyghurs, for example, Tibetans, uh, you know, survivors of the Tiananmen, uh, massacre. Do you think that there's more, there's a stronger sense of solidarity amongst those groups, which, you know, over the past 20 or so years have you know, been a little bit distinct from one another? Um, yeah, I think this offshore is uh, really uh, what I experienced. Uh, before the summer protests in 2019, Hong Kong is, might has the t uh, intention to keep distance with people from Taiwan, from Xinjiang, Tibet, or even keep distance with other citizens in Southeast Asia that are also under the suppression and the threats from Beijing. But after uh, the summer protests in 2019, we learned a lesson how we could maximize our local and global support by interacting with more people around the world. And that's also what uh, we experience. And because uh, always, uh, maybe five or 10 years ago, politicians in Hong Kong fight for democracy might assume or identify the democracy movement in Hong Kong as kind of the local affairs uh, that deal with the Hong Kong local government. But I think after the President Xi be the one who ruled Hong Kong and China, we already realized that whether Hong Kong people can enjoy democracy or not is not depends on the Hong Kong special administration re, uh, special administrative region government. It's about the matter of how Beijing will they respect on the liberal value and the international order. And um, five or ten years ago, who can imagine even the UN Security Council will discuss about the agenda of Hong Kong? But some of the country really try to raise it and put it into the agenda. Uh, later on, of course, it's blocked by Russia and blocked by China. But it also lack people to know that the matter of Hong Kong and the fight for Hong Kong is not only about the matter of Hong Kong anymore. If you could give a message to Xi Jinping right now, what would you what would you focus on? What would you ask him to do? Hold Beijing's accountability in the global community is the first step to get back the trust from the world. No doubt at all, the world has no trust on Beijing already. But how to win back the trust, I think, is they need to realize that how they show no respect on all the joint declaration, international treaty in the liberal order around the world. And if they recognize themselves as the super uh, the superpower around the world, I would say that um, there is no free lunch in the global community. If they hope to be respected, they need to take the responsibility, duty, and even respect it, what's been by listening to the voice of people. So my last question for you, because I realize you've had a pretty long and exhausting and stressful day, is uh, if you were going to be inspired to write another book. What do you think you're going to focus on? Um, frankly speaking, uh, today is 23 of August, and the national security law is implemented uh, was implemented uh, on 30th of June, and now it's already the seventh or the eighth week, and I'm still exist in Hong Kong and still conduct, uh, still able to join this book festival. It's already kind of miracle. It's hard for me to imagine or predict what will be my future and destiny 
and every day I slept, I sleep, I also need to worry about will the government come to arrest me immediately uh, on the day after storm into my house 5 a.m. in the morning, just like what experienced by Jimmy Lai. So if I have time to uh, write a book, I'm not sure will I write the new book uh, in Hong Kong or maybe uh, inside of prison already. But no matter what happened, I hope how we choose not to count out to China and choose to engage in youth activism could encourage more youngsters and millennials around the world to realize that millennials is not only about Snapchat, Instagram, uh, and uh, having selfie or to be footy anymore. It's also about how with the spirit to fight for justice and to uphold the value that being ignored by the authorities and the value that are ignored by the upper-class elite. And that's what I try to do and also hope to impress more people around the world. And my book is named as uh, Unfree Speech. And I hope when Hong Kong uh, one day become the place with freedom and democracy, I can write a book named as Free Speech. It's hard to improve on that as a closing thought. Uh, Joshua, it's been a pleasure and an honor uh, to talk with you today. Uh, we certainly hope that you are able to continue your activism, all of which is guaranteed under international law. We will be there to call out anything that goes wrong and to help push for real respect for human rights. I think the work that you and your allies have done is nothing short of extraordinary and exemplary for a lot of people around the world. Uh, so thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Thanks so much uh, to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and the audience uh, for hosting us this morning. Uh, I am duty bound to remind you that you should not forget the independent online bookshop, shop.edbookfest.co.uk, where audiences can buy all relevant event titles and many more. And to note that this year's festival program is free of charge for everyone, and it is an extraordinary program. Uh, and it's been made possible by the generosity of supporters and donors. Uh, if you've enjoyed this event, we'd love you to consider making a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival so that they can continue their great work of putting on events for as many people as possible. Joshua, thank you so much for your activism. Thanks to Book Festival and to the audience, and we'll close it out here. Thanks very much. Thank you.